Again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the virtual Lubar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. Today, we're uh, talking about recent changes to state election laws across the country and what that might mean for future elections in America. Uh, supporters of the changes, as we know, say they are in response to questions about election integrity, questions about voter fraud, but voting rights advocates say uh, there is no uh, evidence of widespread voter fraud and that these are attempts largely to suppress voter turnout, largely Democratic turnout. My guests today are two people who are familiar with this topic and concerned about it, and uh, they are attorney Molly McGrath and attorney and professor Atiba Ellis. Attorney McGrath is a senior campaign strategist on voting rights at the ACLU's National Political Advocacy Department. There she leads policy and campaigns to protect and expand voting rights across the country. Professor Ellis is a colleague of mine here at Marquette University Law School. He is an expert on voting rights law. His research focuses on that. And like Attorney McGrath, he is a frequent writer and speaker on this topic. I want to thank both of you for being with us today. And, and, and let's set the table for this. Um, I wanted to revisit a conversation the three of us had uh, four years ago. Some of the people who follow this series regularly uh, may remember that conversation. It was about election law changes then, about voting rights then. And so, Professor Ellis, I'll begin this time by asking you just how much has changed. How would you describe the changes we've seen in election law since we last talked four years ago? Well, since we last talked in, at that point, I think it's fair to say that the changes that we saw in terms of you know, the implementation of stricter voter ID regulations and around that time in 2018, thinking about um, how strict it ought to be to prove your identity, comply with you know, absentee ballot regulations and the like, those things, the sort of set the stage, those things accelerated between then and now, because to put it succinctly, the big thing that changed well, two big things changed between then and now. One is the pandemic. And of course the pandemic posed this question to us of, well, how easy should it be to vote in light of um, facing a disease that would prevent us from being in person? Which, you know, as tradition goes, that's the sort of way we think about voting, right? We go to the ballot box, we cast our ballot and we have people watching that process. So in that moment, we opted towards more expansive things like having drop boxes, having more liberal ways of approaching absentee balloting and the like. Of course, where we stand now is part two, the backlash to that. And we've seen a number of conservative legislatures, I have the Brennan Center's website open to my left here, uh, by their count, at least 19 states have enacted 33 laws that make it harder for Americans to vote as of this fall. A lot of those laws are backlashes to this moment of um, voting access ease, right? Restricting access to drop boxes or removing them entirely, making it harder for um, persons other than the voter themselves to deliver their ballot and narrowing the ways that ought to be done. Um, and there's a longer list, and I know Molly knows this list better than I do, but um, the point though is we're seeing another wave of what folks might call voter suppression in terms of the narrowing of access and how that might impact vulnerable communities. But at the same time, and I actually should throw in a third thing. The voter fraud conversation has accelerated due to the rhetoric of President Trump and his allies. That can't be left off the table here. This heightened concern around voter fraud, not supported by evidence, but nonetheless articulated, has accelerated this claim of the need to further secure elections. Now, there might be certain issues where a careful approach might need to be taken, but that is different from claims of widespread voter fraud, which animated all the litigation in the 2020 election aftermath, none of it proven to be true, 
but nonetheless animates these changes we see now in 2021. Ollie McGrath, uh, what do you see at this moment in time that concerns you most? I think, you know, Professor Ellis, really, I want to double down on that last point he made, because I think he really nailed it, is we are seeing attacks on voting rights on multiple fronts. And a lot of this is fueled by this big lie, fueled by deteriorating faith in our democracy, deteriorating faith in the sanctity of our elections and the right to vote, really like this fundamental belief of who we are as Americans. And putting fire on this big live flame is just fueling the demand for laws that are going to restrict the right to vote that are unnecessary barriers to make it harder to vote you know to put uh, a drop box at an early vote location inside instead of at a more convenient place that does nothing to make our elections more secure it only makes it harder to return that ballot. And so as we continue to see this big lie and gas on this big lie uh, put forth by, by extremists, we continue to see demand for some of these laws. And I think it's important to remember this is not, this is, doesn't enjoy widespread support. Some of the pro-voting bills that we see that make voting more accessible and ensure that every voice is heard, like access to vote by mail, access to same day registration, to early voting, these are the things that are incredibly popular and these are the things that our politicians should be focusing on. And when I looked back at you know what some of the conversations we had in 2017, we talked a little bit about Trump's election integrity commission that quickly became defunct, I think, after our talk. And you know, that idea seems quaint now compared to what we are seeing and what and how elevated and escalated the conversation on the big lie is and the deterioration of faith in our democracy. You know, that's, ahead. yeah, go ahead. Please, I just professor. wanted to add something because I think, Molly, you're absolutely right that there is this threat to our de democracy, and all of this is being brought forth in the name of election integrity. I mean, the irony that I take from your comments is that in the name of preserving election integrity, we're actually degrading election integrity because election integrity. And, in, you know, both of you know that I've written about this. Election integrity not only requires ensuring that ballot access is secure and that the process is fair, but it also requires people to perceive ballot access as real. And these initiatives are casting doubt on that important premise. And so even though the proponents of them are claiming election integrity is what's animating this, they're actually undercutting one of the foundations of what election integrity ought to mean. Uh, maybe each of you could respond to this. One thing you will hear from Republican lawmakers is that, um, and, and I think you stated this clearly at the beginning, Professor Ellis, uh, I mean, we've had recounts, we've had audits, we've had canvases, we've had court challenges. What we don't have is, is evidence of wide scale fraud. Uh, yet there is a belief amongst, and we see this in our polling here at the law school, amongst maybe 35 to 40 percent of the people we talk with, that they have doubts about the election results. So the argument becomes um, maybe we should be tightening up a bit on our elections. Maybe we should be making them more uniform. Would that not restore confidence in election outcomes? Uh, Molly McGrath, I'll have you begin with that and, and respond to that, that sort of argument that you hear. I think that's that's right. And that's it's important to remember with some of these sham audits that we're seeing in states like Arizona and now Wisconsin. And same with that post-election litigation that, you know, were, were lawsuits that were really just, you know, skeletons with no meat on it at all. That with things like this, the, the goal isn't what they're going to uncover. We know that. We know from Arizona, we know from past elections that there will not be wide discrepancies, there will not be widespread fraud. But the goal of these isn't to find that. The goal is to continue to cast doubt on our election systems, on our right to vote, so that we feel like, so that, so that others feel like we need to do something to, to, to make this more strict. So the Strumby is going, it's been going for a year already since the last election, and it will continue to grow and continue to build that appetite for, for tightening up our restrictions. Meanwhile, things that we could be doing like 
like uh, passing legislation that would prevent foreign interference in our elections and, and protections on that, or passing national standards like early vote, early vote uh, standards for all so that's equal across states, same day registration, automatic vote registration to make these standards across states even uh, and some national standards. We, we aren't seeing that. Instead, we're just hearing this drumbeat uh, that, that they're playing, and this is their greatest hits. They're gonna be playing it for another year up until next election and keep casting, keep casting doubt on this, even though whatever they uncover through these sham audits or through that post-election litigation does not support their claims. Well, I mean, voter fraud disinformation has been a long time danger in the, to the American Republic. Um, in my own work, I trace this back to, at the minimum, the election of 2020, not the Bush v. Gore debacle in Florida, but the debacle in Missouri, where for the first time after an election, we had um, John Ashcroft, who lost his seat to the late Mel Callahan basically started alleging that voter fraud was to be a thing. And that led to studies under the Bush administration, uh, you know, the Bush W administration, as well as now we've seen in the Trump administration, lots of effort to find evidence of the supposed fraud, but few to any answers coming forward. I'm reminded of Justin Levitt's very famous study of this sort, which found 31 irregularities out of somewhere close to a billion votes cast over elections over nearly a decade, right? There's no there there. So the danger is this disruption of what election integrity ought to mean and distraction from efforts to do the right thing in terms of solving policy problems, right? It, I mean, it's a basic tenet of how we should think about these things. We should solve the problems that exist rather than make up problems that then the solutions come in and pose the threat of excluding the people, particularly the most vulnerable in our political process. And I'll just add one more point here, which is simply that with bad policy comes after effects that we can't foresee. And quite frankly, for my money, when the voter fraud talk didn't work and when the voter fraud litigation didn't work, given the standards the courts held for evidence, then we saw a voter fraud insurrection on January 6th. And that echoes so much the worst of American history, but it's all because of the big lie. At least that's what I would argue. Uh, Attorney McGrath, uh, what are you hearing in your organization? Uh, you, you're in touch with people around the country. Uh, we mentioned earlier that a number of states have moved forward with uh, legislation that, that your organization feels will uh, or could potentially uh, hurt voter turnout, could limit voter access. Uh, where are states, uh, where are the, which states, I guess I should say, are the ones taking perhaps the biggest and boldest steps uh, in, in that direction? We are, we're unfortunately seeing this second wave of voter suppression right after the election in the legislative session starting at the beginning of this year. And like Professor Ellis says, this is, this is legislation that is answering a talking point. This is not legislation that is answering a problem or any sort of legislative record identifying and clearly proving that there's an issue to solve here. So some of the things we're seeing in states like Georgia had an omnibus bill uh, that, that made a lot of national news Florida, Texas, we had a bill introduced here in Wisconsin and common themes that we see here are that these bills, these now laws are going to make it harder to vote. After record voter turnout and record voter turnout by mail, now we're seeing cuts on vote by mail, something that before this election had enjoyed bipartisan support and was actually utilized in a lot of states more by GOP, by Republican voters. And now we're seeing GOP legislatures make it harder to vote by mail. So it's it's not even intuitive. And what we're seeing are cuts to uh, who can vote by mail. We're seeing increased identification requirements in Georgia needing 
to send a photocopy of your uh, of your ID along with your your application to vote by mail. We're seeing restrictions on clerks to even send an application to registered voters to vote by mail. And we're seeing limitations on drop boxes, how many there can be, where they can be located, uh, smaller time windows to return uh, an absentee ballot to ensure it gets there in time, cutting those dates. And so what we're seeing is really you know it's almost like death by a thousand cuts you know we're not seeing as much of like a huge strict id law like we saw kind of in the 2010 and post shelby county wave in 2010 11 12 and 13 in north carolina texas and here in wisconsin but we're seeing a lot of restrictions that are going to have uh, a very very big impact on on people who will be able to cast a ballot a huge impact on traditionally disenfranchised communities um, and it, it, it's, it's incredibly unfortunate, something that we will be, you know, fighting in court that we will continue to organize against that we will hold these, these politicians accountable, both in the legislature and at the ballot box, and and really, really sets up, you know, a smoke sign to our Congress that they have got to act now, and doing nothing doesn't keep us in neutral, doing nothing on the federal level actually takes us back because the damage is done and, and inaction is, is not neutral. I'm gonna come back to that point that you just made, uh, Attorney McGrath, in a moment, but Professor Ellis, how much leeway do uh, state legislatures have right now to enact these kinds of changes? We had a Supreme Court ruling over the summer uh, involving a case in Arizona, and it seemed to suggest that states have a fair amount of leeway as they uh, continue to pass changes to election law. Uh, can states pretty much do, I don't want to say whatever they want, but can they push this pretty far given some of the, the, the decisions that have, have happened? Right, right. So that case that you referred to, Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, a decision of the Supreme Court that came down this past summer, it involved disputes around a number of Arizona's vote counting rules, which put very simply were about how Arizona collected ballots. And the worry was that the way Arizona administered its elections was going to disenfranchise people of color. So the lawsuit was brought under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this actually feeds into Molly's point, because um, I can see her nodding and seeing where I'm going here. The the problem here was whether these rules, though neutral on their face, were had a discriminatory, discriminatory enough of an effect to be illegal under the Voting Rights Act. And Section 2 basically says that it basically makes real the promise of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which says there will be no discrimination on the basis of race in voting. The Supreme Court in a word said, no, this is not sufficiently discriminatory. And the Supreme Court set a number of rules that were had to be complied with in order to, dis, to show a harm significant enough to violate section two of the Voting Rights Act. Now, this decision can be criticized on a number of reasons, including the fact that Justice Alito in offering this opinion, basically looked back to the state of play in 1982, which is odd given that we are in 2021. Um, Justice Alito basically raised the bar in terms of the type of proof that plaintiffs had to bring in order to demonstrate a discriminatory effect. And in particular, he explicitly named voter fraud as an example of a facially neutral policy reason that could justify voting rules. So that sets the bar quite high, particularly for historically disenfranchised minorities who want to bring suit around their right to vote. If you take that along with a number of the rulings in the Supreme Court's so-called shadow docket in the, over the course and leading up to the 2020 election, which showed you know, greater deference in most cases towards states and what they want to decide are the rules as opposed to 
litigants who are using the Voting Rights Act or other constitutional provisions, there seems to be a lot of deference being signaled by the Supreme Court that states can do what they wish. And if we take that coupled with the Shelby County decision, which I'm sure we discussed four years ago, in terms of it putting Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act out of commission, I think the signal is strong that states can do a great deal of what they wish to do. Attorney McGrath, how concerned are you about um, uh, state legislatures um, becoming more and more involved in the actual certification process. Uh, we saw some legislatures, including Wisconsin, select an alternate slate of delegates um, after the votes, uh, or electors after the votes were uh, counted. Uh, you know, how, how concerned are you about that aspect of this discussion? Absolutely, that's, you know, that's also a concern and it's really kind of a new genre of law that we're seeing introduced in states after, you know, after January 6th and after this past election and all of the doubt cast on this last election. And it really, you know, it really demonstrates a few things. One, it shows that, you know, every other election up until this, we had civil servants and election administrators who we've trusted, who do their job, who, you know, do a good job, uh, certifying and ensuring our elections are secure. And nobody had a problem with this when their candidate won. And now and now folks have issues with this. And it, it's unfortunate because we are limiting, uh, limiting the way that clerks can do their jobs by sending things like absentee ballot requests, applications to voters. Um, and, you know, that's creating a chilling effect. And then also, um, you know, the, the, the certification um, that you talked about. And it really demonstrates the need to have, you know, additional protections around this. Uh, additional protections, and, 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 uh, and I'll get to you in one second here, uh, Professor. Um, additional protections, you talked about, uh, Molly McGrath, um, federal legislation. Um, and it's my understanding based on things I've read is that it's possible even as soon as this week that there could be a vote on the, the Freedom to Vote Act, which is a scaled down version of the uh, for the People Act, um, does that have any chance whatsoever of actually becoming law? And I'll begin with you, Molly McGrath, and I'll let Professor Ellis weigh in. Well, this is very timely, Mike, because the vote is going to, in the Senate is going to be uh, this afternoon, uh, roughly two or three, so you're exactly right. Um, so, you know, the good news is, is on the on the national level, there are two bills that really have, um, you know, have that that the Congress has been working on that have a little bit of likes here. And one is the Freedom to Vote Act, which you said is kind of that slimmed down version of what, you know, folks have been talking about for a few years as HR1 or S1 or For the People Act. And then on the other track, we have the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And that would restore the key protections like Professor Ellis mentioned in section two of the Voting Rights Act, section five of the Voting Rights Act, you know, this marquee civil rights legislation that has enjoyed bipartisan support, um, you know, and last time that it was reauthorized, got a Senate vote of 98. So when we, the good news is, is we have these two pieces of key legislation that substantively would do a lot to, make our democracy as good as it's ideal to ensure that voices are heard. And we've seen polls on this. It's public support for both. We've seen corporations come out in support. And the tough part here is the process. And if there is a chance here, so there's really two ways. And one is to get that 60 vote threshold. And that would mean that all 50 Dems would need to be on board plus 10 Republicans to meet that 60 vote threshold just to get it out procedurally for a debate and then 60 votes to pass. Or the second, the second way about this to, to, to turn this into law is a proposal that would modernize our filibuster rules, update our filibuster rules so that we can at least have a debate on the issues and then a vote. And so this is, you know, the filibuster has become so politicized and it really shows the dysfunction in the Senate that we can't even get this out for for a debate. It's one of the one of the things that defines us as Americans is to have a debate on these issues. And I think that you know the urgency to do this and especially on voting rights, something that is so uh, so essential to who we are as Americans that is really you know the foundation of, of so many of our other rights um, that there there is 
such a need to act and you know staying in neutral doing nothing here isn't isn't is actually taking us backwards it's not taking us forward so do i think if i were betting on vegas if i would i see path one for 60 votes unfortunately no and and it's sad because of how politicized this has become because the right to vote shouldn't be politicized and something like the john lewis like the voting rights act like the uh voting rights advancement act these provisions have been uh, you know, signed by Republican governments, uh, Republican presidents five other times. So to see it politicized now um, is unfortunate and really demonstrates the need to update what's happening in the Senate so that we can, can ensure that this right is protected. Uh, Professor Ellis, uh, I, I guess I won't ask you to be a prognosticator, but, but you know, wh what do you think about the likelihood of this happening? And, and what happens if Congress doesn't pass legislation? So I think that the odds are low, right? Uh, to use Attorney McGrath's, um, yeah, I would give Vegas odds of 10 to one that it would pass. And, you know, I would become a very wealthy person as a result of taking those odds. Um, but I think, I mean, certainly the, the debate about the filibuster has a bit more legs if the Democrats choose to bring that debate um, simply because the filibuster is changing the rules itself and that would require a simple majority in the Senate. So that's a little more foreseeable than to see 60 votes to allow the end of the debate and then like Attorney McGrath said 60 votes in order to actually get to an up or down vote. If we don't do this, I think that this trend towards state dominance and this trend towards uh, Republican states just sort of falling in line of making the voting rules more and more strict will continue unabated because by that point we will have signaled at least for this term of Congress that there won't be federal intervention. We now have the signal as well that the courts are hesitant to intervene given the Supreme Court's narrow interpretation. And so states will feel left alone to do. And so those states that are more um, election integrity minded through this voter fraud lens will continue to do so. I'm not saying that elections are going to be abolished, but both the symbolic weight and the actual ease of voting will dry up. And I think that that sends a bad signal to democracy. And to build on another point that we were discussing prior to talking about legislation in Congress, when it comes to this issue of state dominance being driven by voter fraud, the threat of violence and the threat of sort of low level um, disruption, I think is really palatable. In another panel last week, we were discussing the fact that, um, state and local, I mean, local level administrators are feeling under threat that a lot of the voter fraud talk is leading to violence in some places and certainly more and more disruption, even if it doesn't come to violence. So it's not just audits, it's not just recounts that keep ginning up the noise without any actual signal. It's normalizing interference with our elections. And that could be, uh, it's hard to foresee us to be a credible democracy if we give credence to that kind of attitude. I'd like to ask each of you about the, the sort of the real world uh, consequences of election law changes. Molly McGrath, you spent uh, much of your career uh, working with people trying to uh, increase voter access even before you were with the ACLU. Um, what does what do these changes mean uh, in real life to people just living their lives? How do they how are they affected by this? I think that one thing that uh, a lot of times folks like me who work in the you know in the center of these policy and campaign debates need to remember and often sometimes can forget is that for others voting and following this legislation and looking at deadlines is not the center of their life. You know, Americans are busy putting food on the table, raising kids, working a job or two jobs, um, taking care of extended family, going to school. And, and that's, that's what fills their life. 
And when both when there's you know changes that that folks might not know about, might not be following, that change a deadline, change where a Dropbox is, um, you know that that prevents a disenfranchisement effect just because it's going to be harder to vote. And then the lack of knowledge of what these changes are and how how to comply with them. How how in Georgia do I send a photocopy of my deed just to get uh, a ballot? You know. How, like the how to is also a big part. And so there's a huge learning curve that requires a lot of, you know, voter education, which is so frustrating to do to, you know, have to spend spend time and resources because uh, because of an unnecessary obstacle to voting. So when we see when we see these happen, there is such a human effect and, you know, to be, uh, you know, experiences of mine to be knocking on doors or working at a church community meal where there are so many folks who want to vote, but cannot vote, you know, might not be able to have the time to go to the DMV to get an ID, to get to an early vote site when it's open. And it's incredibly, um, you know, it's just, it's incredibly heartbreaking to see the human element of this. And remember that in the middle are, you know, individual people, individual voters, each with their own unique right to vote, whether or not that right is going to change the margin of an election, or there's enough to change the margin of election doesn't matter that these, this is a sacred right that belongs to each, each American and it's incredibly heartbreaking to see, to see these suppressive laws come to life. Professor Ellis, uh, what has your research told you about this? So I think that in addition to this hard fought notion um, for Americans generally, I think about the historical view that lots of blood, sweat, and tears were shed, that people have died um, in the name of gaining the right to vote for all. Um, we talk about the Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, named after John Lewis, who very publicly suffered a beating by the police on the Edmund Pettus bridge, and that served as the impetus for President Johnson signing the, the original Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, I'm thinking about the number of civil rights activists, um, not just in the African American community, but across American history, who have died. And, and in that sense, I, that adds to this notion of sacredness. And that for Americans, particularly people of color who come up from those roots and who deeply value the right to vote and who enjoy things like um, souls to the polls movements in certain states and who actually give a sacredness to their casting of the right to vote and see that as their connection to American history, that these suppressive laws look like an affront, an effort to disconnect. And, and some might think that this is merely an expressive harm, but I think that the vote is what connects us all together as citizens, right? The vote, as the Supreme Court has repeatedly said throughout American history, the vote is the most important of all our rights because it is preservative of all other rights. And so to feel cut off from that poses not just a practical harm, but an expressive harm. And, and it might not be tangible, but it feels real. In just a couple of moments, we'll uh, uh, see if there are any uh, audience questions. If you do have a question, you can just submit them through our Q&A feature. And uh, the Lubar Center's program manager, Hillary DuBlois, will uh, hop on with us later and we'll ask a couple of those. Um, Attorney McGrath, let me come back to you and spend just a couple of moments on Wisconsin. Your, your job right now, your role with the ACLU is on a national level, but you've spent a lot of time in this state. Uh, how would you describe the state of election law in Wisconsin? We had Republicans pass a number uh, of uh, bills uh, earlier this year. The governor vetoed them. Um, how would you describe this moment in Wisconsin's history? Absolutely. And Wisconsin's always going to be home in my favorite state. <laughs> I, I will always be a Badger fan and Packer fan. Um, what we're seeing in Wisconsin is really, um, part, you know, a lot, a lot in the same and systematic to what we're seeing across the country. And so we did see voter suppression laws introduced, passed through the legislature. And some of these laws, I mean, took away the 
uh, the ability for people who were indefinitely confined to vote by mail. They would require them to go and get an ID and they're indefinitely confined to their home already because of age, sickness. Um, and so to, to require them you know, to, to do this is not only illogical, but it's also just kind of cruel on, on a human level. And so seeing laws like this in Wisconsin easily go through the legislature, it really demonstrates the importance of a veto here. We know that this next round of redistricting in Wisconsin is going to be tough. And we are seeing other states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, where a veto really saved a, a voter suppression law coming from just the bill to a law. And so we did see it in Wisconsin, what we saw in states like Georgia and Texas because of the veto. And it really demonstrates how, how here in Wisconsin and some of these other key states that that, that veto is you know, really the last levy before the flood and how essential that is. And if we look at this, not just that, a 2022 election level where it is going to be so essential to have a pro-voting, pro-democracy, pro-voter governor in these key states to protect from these voter suppressive laws. It also really demonstrates how organizing now for 2022 is actually also organizing for 2024 because those states where a veto exists to stop you know, that last levy before the flood of voter suppression, where that exists, that, that those are going to be key states to the White House as well. Professor Ellis, uh, does Wisconsin need to be doing anything differently than what we did say in our most recent elections? That, that seems to be the argument. In fact, you said earlier that you know because of the pandemic, we tried to make voting easier. Do we need to rethink some of the things that we did then to fit uh, circumstances of at least today and maybe tomorrow? Well, I think that in terms of rethinking, it's easy to feel the gravitational pull of the noise of concern about elections. But the evidence shows that, you know, in Wisconsin and certain pundits have said that around the country, despite the pandemic, the 2020 election was actually the safest and fairest election that we have on record in the modern era. And so, in terms of rethinking, I would urge us to rethink in a more expansive way, right? Drop boxes helped, you know, having easy access to no fault absentee voting helped. In fact, I remember voting by drop box in 2020. I walked from my home on the east side down the city hall, dropped my ballot in on my daily walk at 7 a.m., and at that time, we were so concerned, concerned about the coronavirus, you know, it made me not only feel like I did my duty as a citizen, but that I remained safe and that I relied upon the fact that my vote remained safe. And I could ask for that ballot online and certify my credentials there. And then I was able to check to see that my ballot did actually get counted, right? So the, a lot of this is to say, this infrastructure is here, and I think it should be expanded further in order to let voters feel safe and feel like they can participate. You know? Attorney, Attorney McGrath, are, are some states actually doing what Professor Ellis talked about? Uh, we've been talking about um, laws that, that you feel uh, would suppress the vote, but there have also been states, and most of them are led by Democrats, but not all, not exclusively, but there are some states that have passed laws that, that increase voter access. Is there a reason for uh, the ACLU and other organizations to be encouraged by what's happening in some other states? Absolutely. There, you know, there is movement and there are states who are, who are moving us forward and making voting more accessible and ensuring that every voice is heard. States like Nevada that now, that took action during the pandemic to vote every, to mail every registered voter a ballot. And hey, giving voters access works. And so now they're going to do that permanently and also protect uh, and ensure that polling locations and numbers of polling locations are protected at the same time. So we are seeing movement. We're seeing you know, states like Delaware who are working on um, you know, a state with, uh, with that requires an excuse to vote. 
modernizing that and getting rid of those antiquated excuse required to vote and working on that. They passed it once and uh, it, for them, they would need to pass it again to change the constitutional amendment, which uh, we're working on there this next year. So there are steps forward um, that, that need to be applauded and that really demonstrate as, as those states move forward and other states move backward, how those states uh, you know, really, really have increased energy to, to move forward there as well and why, why these policies are so popular. Professor Ellis, I'll give you the final word on this. Is there room for encouragement perhaps in what's happening uh, in other states, at least from your point of view? Yes, I think there is. I, I worry about a day which I think is already almost upon us where your right to vote depends on what state you live in. And, and some commentators have called this the coming of a separate but equal scheme of voting rights in the United States, which harks back to Jim Crow and harks back to the worst of what America has done in the past. But I too would encourage the future to add to the list that Attorney McGrath noted um, there are states that are adopting automatic voter registration so that it's the default that when you turn 18, you are a registered voter and then you have to opt out of registering as opposed to our traditional scheme of every voter having to opt in. Um, reg registering online, those sorts of things I think are encouragement, are improvements and I, I too would encourage us to be more inclusive in promoting voter access. The, the big lie is not real. The fraud storm never happened. We should not let the fear make our decisions about what our democracy ought to be. Uh, I am gonna check in with Hillary Dubois, uh, Lubar Center Program Manager to see if we have any questions that have been submitted in the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Hillary, are you there? I am, Mike. Hello. Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Um, we do have a question, and I will um, pose this one to Professor Ellis first, and then um, Molly, feel free to weigh in as well. Um, there have been a lot of cases protecting the expressive right to give money to politicians. Have there been efforts to link ballot access to the First Amendment's very broad protections? Ah, the classic, can the right to vote be construed as a First Amendment right? argument. So this is a topic that comes up regularly. And, and I think I was actually rereading some of the seminal cases from the 1960s when um, the courts turned away from uh, the last era of laissez-faire, let states do what they want to rules and started setting up under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment this idea that the right to vote is a fundamental right. Um, in those arguments, it was offered that it was an expressive right under the First Amendment, but the Supreme Court has never said that. And, and in some ways, voting rights scholars like me wonder aloud and debate back and forth whether that should be the case. Um, and I know that there are folks who are writing even to this day, arguing that the right to vote should be protected as an expressive right under the First Amendment. Um, on this court, I don't see the votes for it, to be honest, but I get and appreciate the analogy. Um, and I think this is an argument that will continue to develop over time. Attorney McGrath, would you like to, to weigh in on that? Uh, I yeah completely agree, and I think that that's I think it's hard when we look at the makeup of the federal courts and the Supreme Court to see, especially after the Branovich decision um, that Professor Ellis talked about on Section Two, to see a way for them to expand voting protections through litigation. And for uh, for us and for everyone listening, you know that just really emphasizes and really puts a you know, puts a highlighter on the need for us to organize and to expand these rights to this right to vote in other ways. And I'll just add to, you know, the, the ask, the questioner made the analogy to campaign finance laws. It's one of the ironies in thinking about the law of politics generally, that 
as my colleague, um, the late Terry Smith, who is an election law professor mentor to me, most late of DePaul University, he pointed out that there is an irony that there is increasing protection for campaign finance regulation under the guise of free speech, but less protection for the right to vote. This, this, and then we could do a whole other hour on campaign finance regulation, certainly, but suffice it to say here that that asymmetry, at least to me, represents a power dynamic in American politics that is taking us in the wrong direction. Thank you both. Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, Hillary, thanks very much. I'm gonna wrap things up with a, a very basic question for each of you. And uh, you know, on this, uh, this series, we have talked uh, with the, the former head of the state Republican party, and we've talked with uh, uh, the head of Will, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. And, and they all uh, you know, uh, see the need for election law changes. And so we're hearing a different perspective today, at least you, you're advocating for different election changes than the ones they are. But, but here's my question, are you optimistic at this point that there is any common ground to be found on this issue of voter access. Molly McGrath, I'll begin with you. Are you optimist, optimistic about that or, or does reality tell you this is just not going to be possible? Well, I'm probably always optimistic um, or I won't be able to do this work, but I, I do think so. And I think that now in a lot of the work that we're doing, we are seeing increasing increase in, you know in every poll in in different works even in you know red states we are seeing increasing and increasing support for pro voter policies people want folks to have access to the ballot we are seeing businesses speak out and because a, a good democracy is good for our economy and we are seeing businesses really put you know punctuation on that point and how essential it is for for who we are as Americans and to build up you know the, the country that we want to see so I think that what we're seeing is we can't forget that more people want a strong, healthy democracy. They want the right to vote protected. They want to ensure that all voices are heard. They want to ensure that our politicians are accountable to us and not entrenched in power. And so am I optimistic? Yes, because I continue to believe that there are more people on the pro-voter side. Do I get frustrated with, you know, the state of the state of things with the lack of an action at the federal government? Yes. You know, are we going to keep fighting like heck in every way? You know, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm having dreams about Joe Manchin, you know, one of the key senators here that that really shows how much I am, you know, thinking about ways that we can that we can make this happen and stop some of the disenfranchisement and suffering that we are seeing in states across the country. And so you know, do I think we're going to do it, you know, that this is a job just for folks in Washington or for lawyers in courtrooms, you know, absolutely not. And especially here in Wisconsin, this is, you know, a job for all of us. And I remain optimistic that that we will get there and that there's there's more people who believe in our democracy and the sanctity of the right to vote than, than there aren't. Professor Ellis, do you share uh, Molly McGrath's optimism? I think so. But I, my vision of possibility is one that is premised on the notion of if we can sort of bring balance back to the conversation around voting rights, then all the possibilities can be managed. And by that, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, thinking about election integrity is thinking about balancing access with scrutiny, right? Making sure that voter access happens in a way that is fair and managed and given rigorousness, right? We need both in order to get there. What I see from where I sit is a conversation that is out of balance in terms of the degree of rigor that we need to bring to our elections. And the debate about voter suppression where I see it is one that is about an unnecessary and overblown demand for rigor and watching how the concern about access wastes the way. 
So I get frustrated too, but I believe that balance can be, I'm a Star Wars guy, so I'm just going to say it. I believe that balance can be brought back to the force by ensuring that voter access is a true priority and, and looking at the evidence of integrity and seeing that it's there. And, from, and beginning from that point, we can push forward towards what I hope would be a truly universal franchise for all of us. Before we go, um, I just wanted to mention that next week uh, we'll be talking about redistricting and uh, where the state is in the latest uh, efforts to draw new maps. We'll have uh, Jay Heck from Common Cause and Jill Hendrick from Common Sense Wisconsin, two advocacy organizations, uh, telling us what they think is happening and what should be happening with redistricting in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, so we hope you'll join us. That's on October 26th, same time, 12.15 p.m. Um, as we uh, say goodbye, I want to thank everybody who's out there watching today. We appreciate your interest in this topic. But most of all, I want to thank our guests today, Molly McGrath from the ACLU and Professor Atiba to Ellis from Marquette University Law School. Thanks so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts today. And to everyone watching, thank you. We'll see you next time.